Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Penn State College of Medicine COVID-19 Echo Series. We're delighted to have you join us for this morning's session. My name is Jackie Sable. I'm a member of the Echo team, and I'll be facilitating today's session. A few announcements before we begin. If you've not already done so, please put your name, email address, and affiliation in the chat box. Please stay muted unless you're speaking. You can use the star six on your phone or the microphone icon at the bottom left-hand corner of your Zoom screen. You may also use the chat tool for communicating. We realize that question and answer time is important to you, and we try to categorize and address as many questions as possible. But if there are any open questions afterwards, we will always follow up with those. If you have suggestions for future COVID-19 ECHO topics, please share via the chat tool, or you can email us at echo at psu.edu. Please remember that no personally identifiable information is allowed when we're discussing cases. We are recording these sessions and we share all materials and recordings after each session. In the spirit of all teach, all learn, we will be on a first name basis during the session. For those who are new to ECHO, our ECHO sessions always begin with a brief lecture followed by a case. Cases could include a question or challenge that you want to address and are a critical component of the ECHO model. So we encourage you to submit cases when possible. Today's session will include a brief lecture by Dr. Christina Newport on palliative care in COVID-19, followed by a case from, or several cases possibly, from Dr. Sonia Malhorta from the University Medical Center of New Orleans. Um, please feel free to put your questions into the chat. After the lecture and the case, we will start to address those questions. Um, we do have a team of specialists from Penn State online and they will help to field questions, but please remember that this is all teach, all learn, so you can share both questions and answers via the chat. Um, so with that, I am going to turn things over to Christina for our brief lecture. Thank you so much, Jackie, and thanks to the entire ECHO team. The series so far has been really helpful addressing all of the issues across COVID, and we really appreciate that um, the recognition that palliative care is an important part of COVID management as well. So thank you to all of you for being here today, bright and early in the morning, to talk about the various issues that we face. So we'll start just by looking at what are the kind of the primary principles of palliative care to start with? I know that many of you, this is not the main thing that you do, or maybe even something that you've been exposed to before. So we'll talk about just the basics and how they apply in the current pandemic. We'll talk about some of the challenges and the data that we have so far, which is limited on prognostication that helps us to plan and helps our patients to plan ahead um, and have really some pro proactive decision-making in the setting of coronavirus. So I, I just wanna start out with, what we here at Penn State in Palliative Care see as our vision of the care that we provide. And we developed this a couple years ago that's that every person gets the right care at the right time in the right way. And I think this applies across all disciplines, of course, not just palliative care, but this is one of our really driving factors. And I felt the need to point it out here today because of something that one of uh, our colleagues from UCSF said. And uh, recently, Dana Shamas, she's a psychiatrist and a palliative care physician, and she said, you know, we really have to stick to our core principles in what we're doing right now. Coronavirus is like we are a chef in an unfamiliar kitchen. We still have the recipe of how to provide really good care to people, but the tools feel different and things change rapidly. And so we have to be able to be nimble, but we have to stick to our core principles. And so that's really what I wanna focus on today is how we apply the things that we know work well and what is different. So throughout the talk, if you see something in green, then that's what I've kind of identified as what's different in the setting of coronavirus compared to what we do in, in kind of normal day. So just starting with the basics of palliative principles. So we really focus on distress management in patients and for the whole patient. And we use an interdisciplinary team to do that. So we will talk through the various elements of distress that we look at. Then we'll talk about illness understanding and prognostic awareness. So how much the patient understands about what's happening to them and then how we help to use that to proactively plan for patient's care. So we'll jump right into distress management. So we know a lot of people have been familiar with what the various symptoms are that people present with in the setting of coronavirus. Our colleagues in Italy have uh, published 
the symptoms that they saw at end of life. So this is specifically for patients that were dying of COVID. Um, and they looked at the most common symptoms that those patients had. And the most common was fever and dyspnea. And then cough was one of the really bothersome symptoms as well. So these are things that we're really um, accustomed to managing in the setting of palliative care. And so we really, again, stick to our typical symptom management protocols. Um, so for dyspnea and cough, it always starts with treating the underlying condition. So if that's a pneumonia, CHF, COPD, whatever that is, is to treat that condition first, start with that supportive management. We're seeing that oxygen is very quickly a necessary part of the care for dyspnea in the setting of COVID. Um, and we see that patients' hypoxia really escalates very quickly. And so these are things that have to be maybe a faster initiation than in our typical patients. Um, and we are also seeing that patients are needing opioid for symptom management, for management both of, of cough and of dyspnea. And the difference really in this setting is that um, sometimes we're needing to go to opioids faster. And we're seeing the use of continuous infusion of opioids in part um, because of the high need but also because of the nursing burden. So if patients are in a facility, it can decrease the frequency of when the nurse has to go in and out. And I know that some of my colleagues on our call can comment on this um, more so as well. So other symptoms that we're seeing that are some, sometimes difficult to manage is hemoptysis. Um, if it's a patient that has decided they don't want aggressive treatment, we're not going to be doing bronchoscopies and things to address the hemoptysis. So it's really a manage of helping them to cope with um, this, it can be certainly very alarming, particularly for patients that are at home. Um, kind of the old standbys that we know in hospice care at home is, you know, one of the really concerning things is just literally seeing blood and um, seeing that on a white sheet or on a blanket is um, really disturbing. So we encourage people to have dark towels around to be able to um, to adjust the way that that appears to them and also to use anxiolytics in a setting like this. Um, we are all seeing anxiety across the board. In the setting of coronavirus, we use our typical tools of therapeutic presence, sometimes using anxiolytics um, because we know this is a big problem right now. I would direct anybody that's looking for more resources on this to the Center to Advance Palliative Care. This is a membership organization that provides resources for palliative care, but right now they are making all of their resources associated with COVID free to anyone. So you see an example, they do have a kind of a, a, a tip sheet for symptom management. Um, and they have a lot of other resources that we'll talk about. So other symptoms that um, you know, we frequently treat but we're looking at in COVID as well is the fever. Patients, people don't always think about using acetaminophen in the various routes, oral IV or rectal suppositories if patients aren't able to take PO. And if they're not able to take that or if that's not effective, using ice packs under the arms, in the groin, um, a, a wet washcloth across the forehead to be able to relieve that symptom. We all know how terrible it feels when you have a fever. One of the other significant issues we're seeing is delirium and agitation. Um, I just heard a story last night from a um, palliative care geriatrician in a facility taking care of a patient who has dementia and part of their dementia is that they wander around the facility. So this is somebody that is positive for coronavirus. And so they can't allow that person to be wandering around the facility. They're literally a vector of transmission. And so management of that person's underlying dementia and as well as the agitation and delirium that gets exacerbated when they're not able to move around is certainly challenging for them. So we are seeing that in some patients, if they have significant levels of distress, that they actually do require some sedation in that setting so that they're not suffering from delirium at the end of life. So moving on then from our physical symptoms, there certainly are a lot of other non-physical symptoms that come along with this as well. So some of the practical issues are things that are different for us right now. So if patients are going to be at home and family's going to be caring for them, that's difficult at baseline. You know, we really don't have a great infrastructure for home care um, the way that uh, you know, we all wish that we could. So families that are taking care of people at home have the extra challenges now. Either they're sick because they've also been exposed, or they're trying not to get sick. And so then they have to try to um, you know, have their own protective equipment. And these are folks that have not had to think before about sterile procedures and, and providing personal care to patients with uh, trying to limit exposure to bodily fluids. And so those kinds of instructions and that learning curve is really pretty high for family members that had taken care of patients at home. We also are seeing that there's some decrease in the amount of um, services that are available to people at home. So home health, um, some of the therapists and things are limiting 
um, their involvement to patients at home to try to decrease transmission. And so family members and patients themselves are left with more issues of mobility and having to figure out kind of how to navigate that on their own. So more of that is happening over telephonic guidance. So, um, you know, nurses doing uh, visits over the phone and that sort of thing. So I think we are all can understand why then this can result in more spiritual and emotional distress. Um, we are seeing that both in the home setting as well as um, families of patients who are in the inpatient setting. I think uh, you'll see in the, kind of the discussion boards across the country of um, palliative care professionals, this is really one of our biggest challenges. Um, not just for patients with COVID, but also for patients that are in facilities um, either hospitals or nursing facilities, simply because they don't have that same physical presence of family, friends, people that are important to them. And so there's a, a really a significant increase in spiritual and emotional distress. We know that um, spiritual care professionals across the country are having more challenges being able to provide face-to-face -face support um, to people. So we are really trying to make a concerted effort to provide increased presence in other ways and so in virtual ways. One of the things that our palliative care team is doing and I know others are doing in, across the country is um, for patients that are admitted and they're not able to talk with their families on the phone, we are trying to provide that um, regular support to them to give them updates to make sure they know what's happening with their loved ones. And even for our non-COVID patients, we're trying to offer, offer opportunities for an actual visualization of their loved ones, so video chats. I know some places are using baby monitors that have videos so that people can actually see and have some um, bit of connection to the people that they care about. Um, but this really is one of the significant sources of distress and that kind of isolation that this is creating for everyone. So when we think about um, the symptoms and we also think and talk about, well, what's different about dying from a coronavirus as compared to other things? When we really think about the symptom management and how to keep people comfortable at end of life, we really are using the same recipe that we always do. Um, so the things that we typically use can help people um, be comfortable at the very end. The things that really are different is what I already mentioned is that isolation and the lack of the ability to have our goodbyes. This, I think, can't be overstated as to the distress that this causes for both the patients and families. Um, some institutions are not allowing any visitation at all. Um, some are, are having to limit it just to one visitor at the very end of life. And so that can limit that ability to have the closure and kind of have those important discussions that people are um, you know, wanting to have and are really need to have in order to kind of promote good, good uh, bereavement afterwards. This is um, challenging both in facilities and at home. We have a, a patient at home right now who's, who's dying of his cancer. It's um, somebody in their 40s, has a ton of family and community support, but they have to limit the people that can come and spend time with him. So they actually organized a car parade of their whole community <laughs> driving by to show the, the love and the support that they're trying to provide. Um, to that loved one. And so those are important ways of providing kind of the rituals that we're accustomed to, to be able to share support to each other, um, that what, which is limited right now. We also see this challenge is um, causing some distress in, for patients and family or for families after the patients die. So um, funeral directors across the country are trying to adjust protocols because they can't have large gatherings. They can't have the same kind of rituals that we're accustomed to that are helpful to people. And so they're working to have virtual gatherings um, or to have a, a delayed um, you know, events later on. But this is a significant issue for folks in terms of complicating their grief um, from this illness. So then thinking about if people are dying from coronavirus, is hospice being used in this setting? We know that um, you know, hospice really grew out in, in this country, really um, came to a strong fruition in the setting of HIV. And so it's really in the DNA of hospice organizations to provide really good end of life care, even in the setting of a period of time where there's a lot of question, a lot of unknowns and, and a lot of fear, frankly. Um, and so our hospices around the country really are stepping up and still trying to provide that same um, adequate end of life care that, they, that uh, we expect. They, of course, are having to adjust the way that they do things as well. The Center to, of uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services has relax, relaxed some of the requirements for face-to-face -face visits um, so that they are doing some more telephonic support. 
I know that a lot of hospices are only sending their nurses to do face-to-face -face visits, their social workers, their chaplains, their music therapists are doing more virtual visits, um, but still trying to provide the good support. Um, they are facing some challenges, bi-directional challenges, um, taking care of patients in facilities. So either the hospice is um, limiting how many um, clinicians can go in and out of facility or the facility themselves are having to limit the people that are going in and out. So there are some limitations there. They're also facing limitations of, of personal protective equipment. Most hospice care in this country is provided by small hospices, so they have less than 100 patients. So you can imagine that those organizations don't have the purchasing power of some of the bigger healthcare institutions. And, you know, you can't pick up the paper without knowing, without seeing the issues that we have with PPE. And so they're facing those same kind of issues, which limits their ability to care for people at home. So thinking about then, those are our, our kind of symptom management and the way that we're caring for people. So how are we helping to prepare people um, when they're thinking about whether they might get infected with coronavirus and, and what might happen to them. So we know that at baseline, regardless of what anybody's condition is, it's really important that people have a good understanding of their own condition and what to expect from it. So we know we've done our own uh, internal studies looking at illness understanding in the setting of cancer. We know that only about 40 to 50% of patients that have cancer are able to actually express what their stage is or whether they're expected to be cured of their condition. So you can imagine if somebody doesn't have good understanding of their condition to begin with or of what's expected, then it's really hard to make decisions that are really in alignment with what's important to them and what with, um, with good medicine. And so it really starts at the very beginning of um, helping people to understand their own condition and what to expect from it. So this is no different in the setting of coronavirus. So it's our job in the medical field really to help people understand, number one, what, what are they coming in with? So what are their comorbidities? How do we think that that will affect their ability to cope with coronavirus? Um, and then how will we know if somebody's getting better or not? Um, we've really seen a lot of, uh, we, we see this issue all the time, but it's even magnified, I think, in the setting of coronavirus is because patients can't have their family members by their side, the families are reliant on clinicians calling um, home to be able to give them updates. And so often, we as clinicians want to give the most optimistic view that we can, right? And so we'll call and we'll say, oh, the creatinine went down from 2.3 to 2.2 today. And oh, the FiO2 went from 100% to 90%, so this is good. Um, but we sometimes forget to take the big picture to step back and say, but this person is still on renal replacement therapy, they're still prone, they're still on the mechanical ventilator, they're still on vasopressors. And so it's really important for us on a daily basis to be able to give the incremental change, but also to be able to give both patients and families kind of the big picture view of where they're at and what to expect in the days ahead. Um, so this is, we've seen really an important piece of the puzzle is giving accurate updates to patients and families. And again, um, emphasizing the ability for people to be able to see their loved one um, in, in picture is, is really important for them. So if they have some understanding then about what their current situation is, then we have to think, and they're always asking, well, what, what do you expect to happen to me, right? What are my chances? So it's interesting because anytime we have some unknown, we're not, we're not comfortable with that in medicine, right? We always wanna have the data to be able to tell us what to expect. And you know, we're working off only four months of um, this experience, and so we have limited data. I, we, I heard a story just the other day of a, um, from one of our palliative care colleagues who was working with a critical care physician in New England, and they were doing a family meeting for a, an elderly woman, 85-year-old, who was on a ventilator, on vasopressors for three weeks. And the palliative care team asked the critical care physician to comment on what she thought the prognosis would be for that patient. And that patient's goal and what her kind of minimum state of um, acceptable being was, was that she wanted to be able to go golfing a few times a week. So the question to the critical care physician really was, you know, do you think if we continue this kind of care, this woman will ever return to golfing? And that physician was paralyzed. She said, there's no way I can predict this. I, we just don't have enough information about coronavirus to be able to say what's going to happen to this patient. Again, this is a situation where we have to go back to our recipe, right? We have to go back to what we already know. And what we already know is that an 85-year-old woman who's been on a mechanical ventilator for three weeks, who's on vasopressors that entire time, is not expected to get well enough to get back to golfing in the days ahead. 
And so that's with or without coronavirus, right? So we have to stick to what we already know about what to expect for patients and then add in kind of this unknown piece of coronavirus in order to provide really good um, information for our patients and families. So let's look at just what do we know currently about this um, coronavirus and what to expect from it. So we've all heard um, very much so that patients don't do as well if they have comorbid conditions and more people are um, sicker if they have comorbid conditions. The top ones are heart disease, hypertension, cancer, and chronic lung disease. Um, and so we know that those patients aren't doing well. We also know that patients that are older are not doing as well and are more likely to have severe disease. But that's not quite enough data, right? So we need to know a little bit more um, because most of those people do recover. Most of them do survive. And so how do we try to apply this information to our specific patients? So then we look at the case fatality rate. And so this number has been all over the board. And um, I'm sure if you're trying to read that you're seeing that there's changing numbers all the time. So this number is a comparison of how many people die from the condition divided by how many people we know have the condition. So part of the reason that this number is all over the board is because of that very issue that we are all aware of is that we don't know how many people have the condition. Right? There are vastly different um, mechanisms for testing in various countries around the world. And we think that we probably don't have an accurate estimate yet of how many people actually have it. And so if we don't know how many people have it, and we think that there are more people that have it that we have identified, then the number, that case fatality rate is going to look higher, right? It's going to look like more people are dying from it out of the people that have it because we don't have an accurate picture of who all has it. So just looking at the various ranges, they've ranged all the way from 0.7% reported at one point in Germany, all the way up to over 10% in Italy. Um, the number that is uh, kind of hovering around for an overall is about 4% around the world, but this is changing regularly and most experts estimate that it's actually going to settle out at a lower number once we identify how many people actually have the condition. But again, that's still not quite enough, right? We need a little bit more data to be able to apply it specifically to our patients. So when we look at um, kind of the ages and the age range of the people that are actually dying from the condition, our colleagues in Italy published their data looking at the comparison of patients that have the condition as to those who die. And so you see the green bar is an estimate of the median age of patients that are diagnosed and that's lower, closer to 60, but the patients that are dying from it are up closer to 80. When we compare that to our local data, we don't actually have specific data on the deaths um, according to age range, but I'm kind of using a surrogate marker. We do have the data on the positive cases as compared to those that are hospitalized. And so if we look at who is getting diagnosed with it, the, uh, the, the most common age range is 25 to 49 year olds but the people that are sicker from it is the older folks. And so those who are over 65 are the majority of patients that are being hospitalized. Um, so it looks like we are pretty similar to what's being reported in other areas. When we take a step back and we look at the United States data, this is already a little bit old. It's a, a, from a month ago already, um, but this is from the CDC looking at an age breakdown and looking at the severity of the illness and those who uh, die from the illness. So if you take a look at the hospitalization rates as kind of the marker of severity, you see that the people that are the most frequently hospitalized are those who are in the, um, the 85 or over age range. Interestingly, if you move over then to the second column and you look at how many of those people are being moved to the ICU, the 85 and over is not the highest proportion. I think there's a, a little bit question in my mind as to whether this is actually a marker of the severity of their illness or is it because they're making a choice not to go to the ICU? So I think we don't quite have that information yet, but I'm suspicious of that because you still see when you move then to the third column of the people that are dying from it, that that age range remains the, the age range that is the highest um, to die from the condition. So I think this is reflective of what they're choosing um, at end of life. So we have to, these are the data that we have so far to be able to give us a little bit of information of, of how to apply to our patients. So when we're thinking about giving advice to our patients, then the, the next step is, well, what are we actually advising them, right? And so some of the options that we're talking about our patients with are one is, do you want to go to the hospital at all? 
Um, so just in the uh, paper this morning was an article from in London looking at they've had a significant increase in patients that are dying from home at home. More than double the patients as usual are dying at home. And their belief is that people are deciding not to go to the hospital at all. They're not even seeking treatment. And so as a result, more of them are dying at home. And so we are talking to patients about, do you want to seek care in the hospital? If you go to the hospital, do you want to go to the ICU? If you go to the ICU, do you want to be ventilated? And do you want to be resuscitated? So we have to look at some of the data that we have so far on the outcomes of those interventions so that we can advise patients on what might be right for them. So some of the first studies that we have on this came from Wuhan. Um, and so looking at patients that are hospitalized and looking at the mortality rates for that, um, they found that about a third of the patients that, were, that had to be hospitalized for their coronavirus um, died from their condition. When you look then at patients that required um, ICU level care, both in Wuhan and in Washington, about two thirds of the patients that had to go to the ICU level of care died from their condition. And if folks required mechanical ventilation, 81% of those patients um, died from their condition. Now, of course, these were early studies and we already know a little bit more about how to support patients. So we locally are seeing lower rates of mortality for both our ICU and our hospitalized patients. We have a small sample, but we're looking uh, closer to 10%. Um, so again, we have to kind of take these with a grain of salt that um, these were the very early cases. Um, so, uh, you know, comparison to our population might be a little bit skewed. So one of the other, I think, really valuable studies that just came out recently to help us to think about how to advise patients was looking at, in Wuhan, China, um, of patients that were, critic were ill, were in the hospital, and had an in-hospital in cardiac arrest. This looked at their outcomes. And so they had 136 patients in one of their hospitals that had a cardiac arrest in hospital. They divided them into ICU or a floor level of care. But the overall outcome was that um, about 13% of those overall patients were able to be resuscitated, meaning they restored circulation. Um, but at 30 days, less than 3% of those patients survived. And so this obviously is a really pretty low number. So this is patients that have had a cardiac arrest in the setting of their COVID, um, a very low percentage survived. But we do need to think about how does that compare to our kind of standard? Um, and so when we look at the numbers typically of non-COVID patients that have been in hospital cardiac arrest, the numbers really vary widely. Um, they've been reported everywhere from zero to 42%. Typically the papers are settling out around 15 to 20% survival after an in-hospital cardiac arrest, um, and one year survival hovering somewhere around 10%. Still, that's significantly higher than the 2.9% that we saw in this population in Wuhan. Um, when we look at the age range, and the Wuhan study did not break down the age range, 81% of those patients were over 65, but we don't have the breakdown of, the, of, of specific age ranges. But still, when we compare to um, cardiac arrest outcomes of our non-COVID patients, even those that are in the oldest age range, about 14% of those patients survive cardiac arrest. So still that's significantly higher um, than what we saw in the Wuhan population who, that did include um, some uh, older patients. And so we know that the survival after cardiac arrest is significantly lower than what we typically see um, for our patients. And again, that's in hospital cardiac arrest, which is the highest success. If people are at home and they have um, bystander CPR, um, then the numbers of survival are even lower. So we have some of these data now. How do we apply that to our patients and really talk to them about what's appropriate for them? So I kind of break this into three different groups of patients that we can be thinking about. And those are our young, healthy patients that we expect would do well. Um, those with a serious illness who you think could die from another condition within the coming year, even without COVID. Um, and then those patients who do already have coronavirus. And so we have various um, uh, opportunities available for, for people to kind of uh, get, get up to speed on having these conversations if needed. Again, CAPSI is a great resource for this. They actually have videos for the various conversations that you might have. So if you're not already comfortable having these conversations, I encourage you to do that. After these conversations are had, then how do we document um, 
what, uh, what patients want. The first is that the conversation is really what's most important, what's talked about between the patients and their families. Um, but if we can get that documented in the medical record, that's even more important. If patients have made a decision that they don't want aggressive care, then we can put that into an advanced directive or something like a post in Pennsylvania. It's the physician orders for life, uh, Pennsylvania orders for life sustaining treatment or an out of hospital DNR so that anybody that it's involved in the, the care of that patient knows what they, the limitations that they've put on their care. So those are just some of the opportunities for us to be able to document those things. But again, the conversation is really what's most important. I just want to make a brief comment to say that any of these conversations that we're having is really about what's right for the individual patient. This really has nothing to do with rationing. To my knowledge, I don't think that there's been any hospitals in the United States that have actually had to use their crisis management triage protocols. Um, they really are still able to focus on what's appropriate for the individual patient. But this is what's in the news, is every single day you're seeing the rationing. And so I think it's really important that people do have that conversation to say, we're doing what's right for you. This has nothing to do with limitations on, on um, the care that's available. So in, in summary, I just want to emphasize again that our goal is to provide the right care at the right place and the right time um, for all of our patients. And I'd, I'd like to uh, quote one of our colleagues, Nina O'Connor at the University of Pennsylvania, who, you know, just reminds us to remain, to really maintain our true north when we're taking care of patients, um, particularly at end of life, is that our goal is to manage suffering and to facilitate goodbyes, and that we want to do that even in the setting of uh, the challenges that we have right now. So thank you so much for listening, and, and I'm going to turn it over then to uh, Sonia Malhotra, one of our colleagues who can share um, a little bit of uh, the experience that she's had in New Orleans. Hi, good morning, everybody. How are you all doing? Um, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Newport for allowing me to speak um, today. I apologize if you can see my mask. Um, we actually have adopted a universal masking policy here at the hospital, um, here at University Medical Center, New Orleans. And, you know, I want to reiterate Dr. Newport's presentation of, you know, we have to use our data certainly to, um, you know, help us in understanding cases. I think coming out of New Orleans, we're seeing a little bit different data. I'm hoping that that will be presented. But the one thing we are seeing in concordance with the Seattle and the Italian data is that comorbidities definitely make a difference. And having earlier conversations with patients and families um, who have um, comorbidities uh, is, is incredibly important. We here at University Medical Center have adopted an uh, advanced care planning phrase um, for all of our palliative medicine patients to actually ask them what their preferences are in regards to resuscitation, hospitalization, should they be hospitalized with coronavirus. I think it's very, very important to have these conversations when the emotional tone is down. Um, we speak a lot in the world of palliative medicine as to emotion and attending to it, and we've developed several, several mnemonics on how to do this. However, until you see patients in, in the ICU or the hospitalized setting it, where the emotion is running very high, it can be very, very difficult um, to attend to that. The one case that I wanted to highlight from this is, is, is a 79-year-old that I um, recently saw, and I, I tweeted about this if anybody's on Twitter, um, who you know, came in with a cardiac arrest, also happened to be coronavirus uh, positive, that had a longstanding history of um, chronic kidney disease, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, the sort of triage of, um, or I guess I should say multitude of chronic medical conditions. And when looking back, he was very, very sick when he came in um, and actually came in on multiple pressers, had been down in the field for several, um, for, for, for a while actually, and um, came in, we were able to get a pulse on him. And when I looked at um, his advanced care planning documents, nothing in the past had been documented on him. So while having a conversation with his wife, and, and I had been able to reach his wife of 57 years, um, whose main goal was to bring her husband home, said that you know she had never been without her husband and had always predicted that he would be coming home anytime that he was hospitalized. And, just to keep this in reference, he had been hospitalized at least three times in the past three months. 
um, and yet no advanced care planning discussions documented, no goals of care documented. When I told her that likely he would not be returning home, she started sobbing. And, you know, I, I asked her, our hospital has been um, very open to end of life visitation. We allow up to three visitors in full PPE for up to 10 minutes. Um, you know, and when I offered her this as the only thing we could offer for her husband, um, she told me, Doc, I, I can't make it there. I'm in a wheelchair and I don't have a ride. Um, and she lives in a part of a uh, town called New Orleans East where socioeconomic um, distress is, is very high. Um, it's an area that's prevalent with food deserts um, and, and people have lack of access to nutritional food, um, to transportation, all sorts of things. Um, as I was talking to her, she was sobbing on the phone the first time I called her back. She was, she was still continuing to sob and I asked if anybody was there with her and she said that somebody was coming on the way. I got a text from the MICU residents that um, her husband had died and I frankly did not have the courage to tell her on the phone. So I texted the ICU residents back and told them give her 30 minutes until somebody gets there and then call her and let her know that her loved one died. I think what we're seeing a lot in the academic world is we're seeing data, we're trying to extrapolate data to, to what we're able to do. However, when you're on the front lines of this thing, and you know, I, I give so much credit to my ICU colleagues who are there every day, day in, day out, seeing patients. I round with them every morning, but it's not the same when you have to go in. I think we can use the data to help lead our practices. However, we have to also recognize the patient population that we're working with and try to take the data and, and really sort of hone it in to our institutional culture, our community culture, and ensure that we're putting structures in place that make sense for our individual communities. Um, to compare the Italian data to the New Orleans data, um, yes, we have a frame of reference. However, it, it's different. We, we are seeing younger patients. Um, we also at our institution have actually had a very high uh, rate of successful extubation. So, we're not really finding any rhyme or reason. Um, you know, I've, I've seen 49-year-olds uh, terminally extubated. And so, you know, just keeping that in mind that data can lead us somewhere, however, it doesn't apply to all. Um, I will go over another case in, in regards to the comfort care order sets and as, as well as, um, you know, how to sort of make that institutionally a norm. I had a 74 year old patient, um, an immigrant, a Honduran immigrant, um, who before the end of life policies, actually, we allowed um, 10 of her family members to come in to see her. And they all came in to say their goodbyes. And it, the expectation was once we took her off of BiPAP, and weaned her to a high flow nasal cannula that we would provide medications to keep her comfortable through that to ma manage her dyspnea um, and, and her respiratory distress. Um, her respiratory rate probably sat at about 35 for two hours. And my resident, um, and you know, I really thank this resident for being such an advocate, was the overnight resident and I was managing orders and had asked the nursing staff to take in three boluses of IV opioids and two boluses of IV Ativan and give them six minutes apart. And if the patient was still breathing after an hour, anywhere over 24 to go ahead and start a drip. The nurses were very concerned. They were worried. Um, and, and the exact words that were given to my resident were that you're trying to kill our patient. And so I think this has also exposed, this pandemic has exposed a lot of cracks that we have um, in regards to education of comfort care medications and their purposes and how to best utilize them. Again, it's the emotional tone that everybody has, the emotional distress that not only patients and families have, that nurses and, and our staff have and, and how much that can cloud their judgment for taking care of the patient in that time. Um, we were able to get this patient started on a um, 
on a morphine drip, um, was very comfortable, um, only required a few boluses of IV Ativan thereafter to minimize, obviously, the amount of PPE that was utilized in going in and out. Um, and this patient died probably six hours later, very, very comfortably, um, without any respiratory distress once we were able to manage it appropriately. Um, so I want you all to, to really keep that in mind as you're developing comfort care order sets for pandemic purposes. We've, been, we've struggled with the, you know, um, sort of how to best bundle care um, to minimize the use of PPE. And I won't say we've struggled, we've finally come up with great solutions to that, but that is an important um, point to, to remember is that we have to utilize our resources while we have them, because once they're gone, then we have nothing to turn to. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sonia. I um, just really appreciate you sharing your experience. I, I wonder if anybody um, else could comment on a, a couple of pieces of what I heard from you. One is um, certainly the, the distress in staff. Um, and I, I don't know about your institution, but our nurses are being asked to do way more than nursing. You know, they are being asked to be physical therapists. They're being asked to be, you know, phone operators. They're doing so many things in the room. And um, so, and certainly that's been a big a burden for them. Um, if anybody can comment on or share their experiences of how they're supporting staff, um, and, uh, and then also I'd like to hear even uh, maybe from Matt, our, our, who is our palliative medicine fellow, who's currently spending time at the VA, if, um, if maybe he can comment on uh, how some of the symptom management protocols are, are um, in effect there and how those things are being considered. Yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm Matt Devo. I'm actually the palliative care fellow at Penn State. Um, but because of that, I actually spent time um, with a few different agencies like Hospice Central Pennsylvania down here in Central Pennsylvania, and also the VA Medical Center in Lebanon. Um, I've actually kind of been lucky because when I'm at the VA in Lebanon, I spend time with the National Director of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, Dr. Scott Shreve. So I've actually had the opportunity to be a part of conferences from like nationwide throughout the VA health system and kind of hear their stories and see how they're working together to develop the plans right now in place for the patients with COVID. And um, kind of reiterating a lot of the points that have been brought up today, um, it's the treatment plans in place because in the VA, I'm sure a lot of other health systems from everyone who's participating today has huge, you know, visitation policies in place, whether no visitors or a select visitation end of life. Um, when I was talking to some of the physicians in the state of Washington about what they're currently doing just to promote, you know, humanity and, and physical contact and things like that. Um, one of the things that Dr. Newport brought up earlier was how actually baby monitors were being utilized to allow uh, families to participate, like the Wi-Fi enabled ones. So that way you have kind of like a two-way communication of family members to be able to hear their voices and talk back to them. And um, just to provide some type of, you know, normality given the circumstances of everything that's going on. And when it comes to the actual symptom management, you know, the roles of just the nursing staff have changed drastically where you know donning and doffing a PPE um, for symptom management for somebody that's at the end of their life is so difficult and the risk of exposure not only for the staff members caring but you know when they come out of the room and bringing that with them so what some of the hospital systems throughout the VA have started adopting is um, more use of infusions continuously but actually using longer lines so that way, you know, the pumps and things like that are actually in the hallway as opposed to being in the rooms. So that way they could deliver the care to the patients effectively and, click and quickly when you have all these barriers in place from the physical contact perspective. Thank you, Matt, for sharing some of that experience. I'm, I wonder, I know that we have a couple of folks from our local hospices. Um, if Maria or Eva um, 
would want to comment on how you are supporting your staff and helping them um, to uh, kind of allay the, the concerns and stress that they may have about caring for patients. Hey, Christy, this is Maria Olander. I just want to say thank you again for this wonderful presentation. Um, I'm the Associate Medical Director at the Hospice of Central Pennsylvania, and we are having um, a lot of staff distress about the potential for their own, um, their own spread of coronavirus, particularly if they are infected. We have a lot of staff who are concerned about the asymptomatic carrier potential, and they're going into these facilities where we're still allowed to go in, and they are um, you know, asking the question of facilities, do you have positive cases? Um, could we use some of the PPE that you have for your staff? Because we are all really running well on our supplies. Um, and sometimes we are um, really met with a lot of hesitation about any kind of PPE. You know, we can't use theirs. We, we have to use what we have. And so my staff are very much in an emotional roller coaster because they want to help the patients. They understand that they're going to be declining quite quickly, but they also are extremely concerned about passing this to other number one patients in nursing homes, number two, the patients that they have in the home-based care setting, and number three, their own family members. And so we have just designed a policy that we're not going to let staff take care directly of a COVID positive patient unless they have an N95 um, I know CDC guidelines have been, you know, altered as a result of the PPE shortage, but that's the kind of, um, you know, promise that we've made to our staff. Um, you know, additionally, we've had circumstances where we've actually had to transfer patients off of our hospice because of the concern that a patient was demonstrating potential symptoms of coronavirus, but we could not get her tested fast enough, and we would not have the results fast enough to get a accurate understanding of what her disease process really was. Um, uniquely, this patient did have a metastatic cancer presenting with cough and shortness of breath. Not surprising given her underlying condition. However, the concern of coronavirus was certainly present there as she was actually a previous um, employee at a medical center mm -hmm. and had family members that were coming in and out of the home frequently. And so, you know, we made the kind of very rapid decision that I cannot send staff in there, particularly if we don't have PPE and most especially at nighttime, if there's acute crisis, I don't feel comfortable sending staff in there. So we made the decision based upon those factors to transfer her to a hospice that had the PPE availability to care for her on a regular basis. Um, you know, those kinds of case by case analyses are being done like almost every day in my hospice because we're hearing patients that develop new symptoms and we have to triage, you know, are we going to recommend that we do testing for them? Can we keep them on our service? Do we have to transfer them urgently because we don't have the PPE to support their care? Um, you know, those kinds of questions are being brought up from staff members directly to the leadership team in my hospice. And those are questions that we're being asked on a regular basis. Thank you, Marie. I think it really demonstrates just some of the complexities um, of that just makes the simple care that you want to provide and that the mission that you have, it makes it really hard to be able to um, just fulfill the mission that you have. Um, I, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb. I see Susan Williamson is on from Department of Health and I don't personally know Susan, so I don't know what she's able to comment on, but I wonder if um, she has the ability to comment for us on kind of the status of PPE for um, you know, our nursing facilities for our hospices and that kind of thing. Susan, if you're talking, we're not able to hear you right now. All right, are there others who have questions or comments that you'd like to share for the group? Um, this is on and off topic. You know, I'm Jim Hayden, I'm from uh, Broadtop in Huntington. Um, the, I was unable to get to the uh, ECHO project uh, presentation on burnout. I had one of my staff do it. Um, 
when I went to the resources, I was looking to see if it was available uh, to uh, view, and all I could find was a PDF. I asking because one of the things with the staff is the person who attended that thought it might be good for everybody to look at and hear. And is that still accessible? Hi, Jim. I can address that for you. So we have um, been putting all of our recorded echo sessions on our YouTube playlist. So we will drop that link in the chat for you and for everybody who wants to access previous sessions. Thank you for uh, the questions about that. And, and also to put a plug in for, I think later today, correct, is um, session on um, in the skilled nursing facilities. It, it's um, a significant issue that I think a lot of us have, have interaction with. Um, so please uh, feel free if you have questions or comments to put them in uh, the chat or um, to, to go ahead and speak up. I'm, I'd like to reach out. I see some of my team who are working in the hospital right now. Um, Andy, I don't know if you, you've had some thoughts or comments that you'd like to weigh in on any of the topics were discussed or, or even about the moral distress that uh, James had just asked about. I think it's definitely a challenge given the circumstances of kind of continuing to um, support both the patients and families, but also the staff as we're kind of working our way around the facility. There's a, there is a lot of kind of fear and anxiety among people on the floor about kind of what's going on. It's just, you, you can definitely feel the edge of that when you're in the institution. And we've been fortunate to this point that we haven't had to deal with the numbers of COVID patients that other places around the country have dealt with. So I think ours is a, a different kind of set of circumstances than certainly um, other places around the country. So. And, and Christina, I can comment on that as one of the centers um, and cities with a very high amount of cases for such a small population. I think one of the things that when building sort of structures around how you can help, because everybody wants to help, it's a matter of what can you do to help. Um, I think a lot of people are looking for direction on that. I would encourage you all to reframe that into find ways that you can help. Find ways to integrate yourself into the structure of what's already being done to alleviate your frontline teams. Um, our field of palliative medicine just made the cover of Lancet. And I think that this is going to be hopeful for our field to finally be integrated into every planning process that hospital institutions um, systems take nationally and internationally. We have integrated ourselves into the ICU. We are an automated consult for every ICU level patient that comes in with coronavirus. At one point, we had five ICUs built into this hospital. We are traditionally a two ICU center. And we, as a palliative medicine group, decided to take on consults seven days a week to alleviate the burden of our ICU teams, to call families, update them, discuss goals of care. Um, I think you know, there are other centers that are going to hit their peak. We've already hit our peak here in New Orleans, and yet we're still seeing a pretty high influx of cases. I think it's important for everyone to think about how can they best help their frontline staff mm -hmm. and take off some of the burden of what they're having to do. For us, it was doing goals of care and becoming automated in the ICU, doing video chats with families, and we lay that expectation up front that you know, we have a long list of families who want to see their loved ones. And so we're able to accommodate video chats one to two times per week at most, um, you know, to be able to, to educate families on end of life policies, and then also to give them guidance. Um, our health grade literacy level here in New Orleans, um, you know, we're a safety net hospital, is somewhere between the first to second grade of health grade literacy. And so to be able to, um, educate families on coronavirus, its infectivity, and then provide them resources for it. So we have a hotline here that families can call should they be experiencing symptoms. Um, being able to also walk with them through that is, is incredibly important. 
Thank you so much for sharing that, Sonia. And, and we have found the same to be true. Um, we started off in the ICU and, and the quickly our critical care colleagues just asked us for be, to, to be involved in all of the cases there. We actually also had our first, thanks to my colleague Andy, we actually had our first invitation from the emergency department to um, go and talk with them about uh, palliative care and hospice resources to them. You know, obviously it's been a need in the emergency department for a long time, but this has prompted a little bit more of that relationship. Um, you know, we also are hearing and seeing ourselves that um, not only our colleagues, but the patients and the families are really hungry for these conversations. You know, if you're reading in the newspaper that, oh, people that have the condition that I have are dying from this, they want to hear from their clinicians, right? They want somebody to proactively say, hey, are you thinking about this? Is this something you're worried about? Let's talk about how it actually applies to you. So certainly encouraging, you know, we've been working with our primary care um, colleagues as well to make sure that they feel that they can have the conversations. And frankly, they haven't needed our help. But I think they, our colleagues just want to know that they have it there available um, if it's needed. So appreciate that. Um, I do see that. Thank you to Susan. She was, uh, she did comment. She was trying to talk to us and, and wasn't able to unmute, but she did say that the Department of Health is trying to push um, protective equipment out to facilities. She's not aware of what that schedule is, um, but we're glad to know that there is some of that support because we as an institution have recognized, um, you know, when we reach out, the facilities want to help, but um, much like our hospice colleagues, you know, they want to fulfill the mission, but they also want to do it safely, both for the patients and for their staff. And so the PPE still remains a challenge and some of the limits to being able to take care of patients out in the community. Are there others that have questions or comments before uh, we close? So I'd, I personally want to thank everybody for just taking some time to think and talk about um, these issues. Please uh, feel free to reach out if you have additional questions later. Um, also, please make use of the resources that are available. Um, literally pretty much any issue that you can come up with related to palliative care and COVID, our uh, National Organization Center to Advance Palliative Care has tried to address. There are very um, easily accessible tools that can be you know, taken right off of there, shared with learners, shared with your colleagues that are not accustomed to having these conversations or having to do the symptom management. Um, so please um, make a use of those things. And uh, I, you know, just really appreciate all the good work that all of you are doing to support patients right now. Thank you so much, Christina and Sonia. We really appreciate your being here today. Um, just a few reminders in closing. You are able to connect, uh, collect CMEs for participating today. A survey is always sent after the session. Please complete one survey for each session that you attend, and you can use the same link for each submission. As mentioned earlier, all the materials from today will be shared via email. Um, and please consider submitting case discussion items, which could include follow-up questions or items from today. And um, finally, as Christina had mentioned, we hope you'll join us for our next ECHO session scheduled for this afternoon at 4 p.m. Um, Drs. Aisha Ahmad and Nicole Asavala will begin a series pertaining to skilled nursing homes during COVID. And if you have a patient case or question on this topic, please let us know. And it's always beneficial to discuss your strategies and challenges. Please continue to watch your email for additional sessions. And we hope to see you again.